Hi everyone, happy Tuesday, it's John. And I don't have a book review for you today, but um, I know people tend to like these kinds of uh, videos more. So I'll just show you some more books. This is kind of an ongoing, I've said this before, sort of an ongoing book haul, if you want to call it that. I tend to buy sometimes more than 10 books uh, a month. So I get behind on showing them, so I have an ever-increasing list of new books, and they're not new, but new-to-me books that I want to show you that just keep stacking up. So every month or six weeks, I want to show you ten more. I try to limit myself to ten because I know more than that can be, can be a little cumbersome sometimes. But um, here are ten more. <clears throat> a little... A little heavy on the uh, history, I think, uh, like usual, but um, I'll just get started, I guess. The first one uh, is something I actually got from another booktuber, uh, Peg, over uh, at her channel called The History Shelf. She sent me this because I answered her question on her video that she asked me about... Um, Oh, yeah, it was it was the 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 name of the ship in Alien, right, or or something to that effect. And of course, it's the Nostromo. Uh, was totally sort of surprised that I was the only person that replied, since it was one of the first things that she asked in the video. But this is she sent me a couple of choices of things to pick out, and this is what I got. This is um, the Architect of Empire, Walter Raleigh, spelled without an I. <laughs> by Alan Gallet. I don't know. I didn't ask Peg if she ever got a chance to read this. Peg, if you did, um, I don't think you ever let me know what you thought about it. Um, so uh, let me know, uh, either in the comments or uh, or wherever. Um, and I want to say, yeah, he teaches at um, Texas Christian University, which I think is in... Lubbock or something? I I don't know. It's in Texas, obviously. Um, but it is... I, I did not know there was enough information out there for a 500-page biography on um, Raleigh, but um, I guess there is. And uh, apparently I've, I've discovered that since then there are several 500-page biographies of Walter Raleigh. But um, this looked really good. I'm always sort of fascinated by uh, late uh, late 16th century uh, English stuff and the, the beginning of uh, the, the, the sort of the rise of English maritime supremacy after Spain. Uh, I found this. Uh, this is by a writer who I have a little bit of previous familiarity with. He wrote a book quite a while ago called The Anatomy of Fascism. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It explains the historical rise and qualities of fascism throughout Europe in the 30s and 40s. And this is this is his real area of scholarly interest. It's called a Vichy France Old Guard and a New Order, 1940, 40 to 1944, by Robert Paxton. I think he taught at um, Columbia. Yeah, professor of uh, modern Western European history, Columbia. I wanted to spend some more time this year uh, getting away from, not just getting away from history, but this book is getting away from history, reading some some short stories. And I'm reading a book now that I, I, I don't want to say what book it is because I'll, I'll be reviewing it and you'll be hearing all about it when I ramble on in front of the camera, but um, this guy is not really known as so much of a short story writer. He's more known for his mordant, witty, wry comedy um, in novel form, but not so much in short story form. I'm not even sure I could name a short story by this guy, but... Um, Every Man's Library came out with a whole volume of them, including almost all of his juvenilia. Um, this is um, 
so sorry about the glare. It's Evil and Wall. It's the complete short stories of Evil and Wall. So, um, I saw this uh, for, I think, four or five dollars on a used, used book site. And if you don't mind, um, library editions, and I certainly don't, the, they, <clears throat> they do come with this sometimes glare, this cellophane causing glare. There you can see my computer screen. Um, then, then they're great. Um, the site that I buy them from always tells you when you're getting a library copy though. So that's wonderful. So people who don't like library copies can can know what they're getting and what they're not. Um, I don't think anyone in the history-loving community needs an introduction to this author or the book. This is a Penguin History of the United States. Which volume it is, I think it's the second to, second to last or third to last. It's the Pursuit of Power by Richard J. Evans. Uh, not American history, I'm sorry. Of course, it's European history. Europe, uh, 1815. So, right at Napoleon's exile, I think that is, uh, to the beginning of World War I, 1914. There's this wonderful little store in the front of my library uh, that's in a town close to me that uh, sell, that regularly pulls books. And it's not a library book sale because they're always open. They're open for four to six hours a day. And they, they're always uh, pulling out books and selling them for, you know, two or three dollars. I did not pay six dollars for this. I paid one fifty. And it's in brand new shape, too. Um, great store. And I go, uh, try to go every week because they, they pull things every week and, try to go and get first dibs and all that good stuff. Uh, also found this there on the same day, I think. Um, Robert J. Lifton uh, was a psychiatrist back in the 40s and 50s, and he wrote a book called The Nazi Doctors. Yes, it's up on my bookshelf, so I just wanted to make sure I got the title right. He did some of the first really medically groundbreaking and psychiatrically groundbreaking work with uh, working with trauma in people who had survived the Holocaust. Um, people who had survived the camps. He talked to camp survivors, but he also talked to camp officials, the Nazis themselves and got all kinds of perspectives, did thousands of individual case studies, and wrote a series of books about what he found, about trauma, about war, about suffering, about what it does to the human mind, and, and all of that stuff. A, a, a really impressive corpus of, of books. And this is his biography. It came out... I want to say maybe 10 years ago or so. Two thousand eleven. This is Robert J. Lifton's Witness to an Extreme Century, a memoir. And not only does he talk about his his work and the conclusions that he's made after he's now in his nineties. It's still around. I don't know if he's still writing, but not only the conclusions that he made in his work, but the actual conducting of of the studies and meeting these these Nazis and meeting the people who who came this close to not making it out of those camps. Um, it's it's bound to be. I haven't started it. I haven't even browsed through it, but it's bound to be some really harrowing reading but a fascinating topic. So, um, this, I, I think for, for two or three dollars, I'd seen this, um, in book reviews and journals and a few times mentioned on, uh, on booktube. And I, I knew the name of the writer. <clears throat> Isn't she the, 
the president of Harvard now or something. Yeah, well, at least she was when, when this book was published. It's uh, Drew Gilpin Faust's This Republic of Suffering, Death and the American Civil War. Um, I can't really tell you too much more about it. I haven't even read the inside covers, uh, except that it, it sounds like it's sort of um, uh, just one of those meditations on like uh, cultural history and our understanding of death and war. There was a, another really great book I reviewed several, several years ago that's, that was along the same lines, but in Europe in World War I. Um, I can't even, can't even remember the name of the book now. I think it was by George Moss. But um, This Republic of Suffering, if you've, if you've read this, it's probably the most popular book in the pile. Um, I would be interested to hear anyone's opinions on any of these, but uh, this too. So next, I still have the, sorry about that, the paper in there. Um, I think everyone probably knows about Darmaid McCullough, too. Wrote that giant 1,000 page uh, history of the Reformation, and then he wrote another gigantic book on uh, the 3,000 year history of Christianity. Um, obviously going back before Christ quite a bit. <laughs> but this is his biography of Thomas Cranmer, who was uh, a very, very close associate to uh, Henry VIII, and uh, one of his, his close advisors, and an important person in the, uh, the early 1500s, early 16th century English history. And just in spectacular condition i mean it does it looks like it's never been read and it's from <clears throat> yale university press new haven i think i got it for uh on that site i was talking about three bucks i mean three or four dollars for a hardback unread <laughs> uh copy of thomas cranmer's biography by someone who you know will be a great historian uh, already is a great historian but someone who will tell you a fascinating story about someone this is a book <coughs> by keith thomas uh this book is probably a little academic doesn't get much play on youtube but it is a classic in its field and it is uh, the decline of uh, religion and the decline of magic. And does it have a subtitle? I think it does. It does. Studies and Popular Beliefs in 16th and 17th Century England. And in a nutshell, what this book is about <clears throat> is the displacement of religious belief by institutionalized religion in the 16th and 17th centuries. So uh, there were just sort of hover, hovering around Europe in the popular imagination beliefs about magic. Of course, you know, magic before modernity came around was a pretty common assumption. Demons, witches, the devil... They all really interacted with the world in very everyday ways, right? So you had good luck charms and omens and uh, talismans and things like that. And this this kind of thinking was very was thought of to be very separate from formal religion. It was sort of like a folk magic. But religion, the story tells the, and it is quite a chunky story, uh, tells the history of how institutionalized religion in the form of first the Catholic Church, and then, at least in, in England, the, um, the Church of England, and, and Protestant sects to a certain degree, I think, 
came and they, they saw those kinds of folk magic as being threatening to religion. So they tried to squelch them out and uh, succeeded to a large extent. But as you can tell by the way that we still believe in ghosts and things like that, um, we're not completely successful. So this is the history of that story. It is it's the book that sort of defined Keith Thomas as a, as a scholar. He wrote it in the early 70s. And since he's written a dozen books all about late, well, let's just say early modernity, uh, especially, you know, England and, and North Europe in, in early modern times. All right, two more. This is a book by uh, Northrop Fry. Northrop Fry is the great, great literary critic that came out of, of Canada in the 20th century. He wrote a book in the 80s. 70s or 80s called The Bible as Literature, and is actually on my channel if you want to go read uh, or uh, hear a review of it. It was wonderful. It was reading the Bible as a piece of literature and not as a piece of liter uh, as a, not a piece of uh, religious text so not for devotional purposes not to read it as god's word but to read it as a narrative to see what kinds of narrative arcs it uses what kind of tools it uses to engage the reader when you look at the different gospels how the different gospel writers shaped their stories in different ways to engage different audiences things like that he wrote another book several years later to follow it up and sort of fill out some of the ideas that he had left unelaborated in the Bible as literature. And that book is this one. It's called Words with Power. Words with Power being a second study of the Bible and literature by Northrop Frye. I will read anything that Northrop Frye writes. Uh, his famous book is, well, it's kind of buried under a pile over here. It's called The Anatomy of Criticism, which he wrote in the 50s, I think. And it is the, the book that he's most known for, but he's written lots and lots of other things. And you occasionally see them pop up for just um, a song on some of these book sale uh, and discount book sites. So I picked this up as soon as I saw it. Okay, one more. Uh, if you like and are familiar with Spanish history, again, the same period, uh, 15th, 16th century, that sort of thing. Uh, this is Henry Kamen. This is his book on the Spanish Inquisition. It is a highly, highly revisionist history of the Spanish Inquisition. Um, kind of takes the very um, controversial opinion that the Spanish Inquisition was not as big a deal as we usually make it out to be, um, which some people might have some issues with, understandably, considering how it's usually taught and understood in the American imagination in the 21st century. But um, I've, I've read, I think, a couple of other books by Cayman, but never this one. All right, there you go, 19 minutes, 10 books. That's not too bad. I will see you next week. Bye.